Okay, great. So tonight, as I mentioned earlier, our president, our presenter is uh, Kevin Zanjani of BioNO Battery, uh, Battery, excuse me, BioNO Power uh, of Santa Ana. He's going to talk to us about the state of the art of lithium iron phosphate batteries, uh, which are, uh, as I've been told, safer, longer lasting, and more efficient than the batteries you're used to trying to lug around. They might even be an ounce or two lighter. Uh, they work well with solar panels and are popular for hams. I know I've used them and many of you have as well, as Rob just mentioned. Kevin, are you ready to go? Yeah, can you uh, allow me to share my screen? Yeah, I'll, let me check one second. I think I've already done that. Okay, let's oh, no, Here we go. Okay, all right. Okay, you should be good to go, Kevin. Hang on a second, We, Kevin is hiding. Oh no, it was at 7.30. Oh no, he was here at 6.45. So maybe we've just lost him for a moment. I'm looking. Brad, any sight of Kevin? No, it looks like uh, he uh, fell off there. He went dark and then fell off. Yeah, so. I saw a note that said he, he left the meeting. So hopefully he's logging back in. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll hope, hope so. Um, so. Give me just a moment here. I've got his number, I'm gonna text him. Yeah, I, uh, I can find his number as well if we need to. I'm just hoping that he'll be back with us here shortly. Well, while we're waiting, anybody have a good joke? <laughs> I, I will tell you that uh, Kevin and his company have graciously agreed to provide a prize, a bio uh, prize that we would like, that any of us would like to have that is going to be uh, given to uh, uh, the winner of the contest in the Rover Roundup. Um, maybe when he found out that we knew that, he decided not to show not to show up. Comment. Uh, he just ahead, texted John. back, said coming up. So I don't know what's taking him, but he knows what's going on, evidently. Okay. Well, he told me that he has rewritten his presentation, so this will be a, a new presentation for him. So maybe he's just uh, struggling with getting everything operable. Hey, Brad, I, I have a quick, uh, quick joke. Go what's ahead. the most, what's the most expensive free gift you can get? A radio. No, a 15% uh, off coupon for bio any, bio any, bio NL batteries that Bill Wilcox KF uh, 6J QL gave me uh, a year or so ago. And I ended up building, I have a great battery box, but it was an expensive one. <laughs> you want to hear a joke? Go ahead, Jonathan. A rabbi and a priest are sitting together on a bus. After a bit, the priest 
turned to the rabbi and asked, is it still a requirement of your faith that you not eat pork? The rabbi responded, yes, that's still one of our beliefs. The priest then asks, have you ever eaten pork? To which the rabbi replied, yes, on one occasion, I did succumb to the temptation and tasted a ham sandwich. A while later, the rabbi spoke up and asked the priest, Father, is it still a requirement of your faith that you remain celibate? The, the priest replied, yes, that's very much a part of our faith. The rabbi then asked, Father, have you ever fallen to the temptation of the flesh? The priest replied, yes, rabbi. On one occasion, I was weak and broke with my faith. The rabbi nodded understandably and remained silent and thinking for about five minutes, he finally said, beats a ham sandwich, doesn't it? <laughs> and there you have it. There you go. Now, Jonathan, have you had any contact with uh, Kevin? You know, not since I showed him those laughy faces when he said he's coming up. So I'll say we're waiting. Okay. Uh, this is actually Tyler, KM6EWJ. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just wanted to let everybody know that it is Lindsay's birthday today, KM6TXE. Say hi, Happy Lindsay. birthday, Lindsay. Oh. I'm in a weird background. Hi. <laughs> yep, it's Lindsay's birthday. Good job, Lindsay. It looks like you you were all set up for uh, St. Patrick's Day. All right, let me see here. I'm going to. Brett, while we're waiting, I have a comment about the batteries. Uh, go right ahead. I had a sealed lead acid battery in my go kit and it was very heavy. And you were talking about the lithium iron phosphate batteries being ounces lighter. It, it's literally, the comparable battery is literally three times as light. It's very, very much easier to deal with taking it in and out of the car, et cetera. Um, very convenient. It was it was certainly much more expensive, but it was worth it. Well, that's you know that's terrific. Now you can carry three of them. Ah. <laughs> no, I only need one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Steve, uh, did you have something to share there? I was just showing my bio on a battery. I have one. I well, like it. If you're showing boxes, 50 amp hours, right? Blue light. This is 12 amp hours. <laughs> one, two. Uh, yeah. So Andy, what are you talking about 50 amp hours? That's in that box, 50 amp hours, and you can carry it. Hey, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Kevin? Yeah, I had to reboot my router. Something happened in my office. Test sorry. one, two. I apologize for that. <laughs> Didn't mean that to happen. Um, okay. All right. Can we share my screen? Uh, is it coming up here? Okay. Right. I think so. Let me check. Okay. You, since you checked back in. Yeah, I, I did a router reboot. I don't know what happened. I, th I hope they're not... AT&T is not digging up something out there. Just a something. second. Okay. <laughs> that's the first time that's happened, gentlemen. Okay. I It was not intentional, right? That was the, actually the first time I've ever perfect. Uh, Murphy's Law, as they say. So, okay. so you should be good to go. All right. Um, okay. So let's share my screen. Uh, okay. See a battery backup for your router. There you go. Your, you know, screen, your screen is up. It's uh, there were some people talking about packets earlier. Well, maybe we'll talk about packets later on routers. So, um, in any event, the uh, screen is up here. Uh, so, uh, well, appreciate the opportunity to be with you 
this evening. Um, so this presentation is on lithium iron phosphate batteries for solar and ham radio applications. Um, probably some of you have seen this presentation uh, before a few years ago at CVARC when I had a chance to come visit uh, you guys. Um, uh, in the past couple of years, we have some good news. Um, in 2018, we moved to a larger facility in Santa Ana. Um, we're off of McFadden and Harbor Boulevard. Uh, our website is up there, www.bionopower.com, uh, as well as uh, email. So if you have any questions, we're going to uh, save the questions until the end of the presentation. Um, so that's probably the best way to do that through this presentation. Um, we were founded in 2010. Uh, we're a manufacturer of lithium iron phosphate batteries. Some of you may not be familiar with this technology. Um, this particular technology is different um, than lead acid batteries that you've probably been using over the past several years. This particular battery chemistry offers two to 3,000 charge cycles, um, seven to 10 year service life. Um, and uh, it's about a quarter of the weight of a lead acid battery. Uh, we also provide various types of solar products, including foldable solar panels and controllers that can be used for charging these batteries. We've implemented uh, various ISO quality and environmental standards. Um, we've offered a world-class technology uh, after sales service warranty, and now we do have customers worldwide. So uh, we serve uh, various uh, markets across the country. Um, and a little bit of a perspective of where we're coming from as a company. Uh, we continue to do work with various different federal agencies, for example. Uh, so one of the agencies that we currently do business with includes DEA. They use some of our power pack products that have a built-in uh, battery as well as an inverter and USB output for powering various types of devices uh, out in the field. Um, and so these are some of our power pack products as well as uh, various other agencies, including, for example, a DHS. So some of you might be familiar with a Raspberry Pi computer. Um, so Raspberry Pi is a postage stamp size computer that has a built-in uh, CPU, memory, controller circuitry that's in there. And they use some of our um, 20 amp hour batteries. In fact, some of our batteries that we have here, uh, you can see they have power pole connectors um, that are already attached to the batteries. Um, they weigh about five and a half pounds. Uh, they use this to power uh, various types of Raspberry Pi computers out in the field um, that uh, DHS is currently using. Uh, Department of Labor, um, you might be wondering, well, why is the Department of Labor, uh, why, why would they be interested in, in batteries? Um, well, there is an agency within the uh, Department of Labor that uses some of our larger batteries for mining applications. Um, so there's still coal mining going on in the central part of the country, um, and they've been using very large lead acid batteries uh, over the years. And they wanted something that's much lighter, lasts much longer. So they're using some of our 100 amp hour batteries, battery that weighs about 28 pounds to replace batteries that weighed nearly a hundred pounds. So uh, a tremendous weight savings and also better performance because they can capture uh, 90 to 95% usable capacity versus a lead acid battery, which only about 50% is usable. We'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Now, some of you might be interested, the uh, next uh, agency that we do business with is the Forest Service. You might be wondering, well, why does the Forest Service, why would they be interested in batteries? Um, well, it's a very interesting application of batteries in the Forest Service. So uh, you have your federal tax dollars, they go to fund uh, various uh, scientists out in the field within the Forest Service. Um, effectively, what they're doing is they're wearing a very large capacitor on their back using some of our 12 amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries to charge this capacitor up. And they stick a very long metal rod inside of fresh water and they send a jolt of electrical current into that rod and the fish pop up out of the water. Uh, they measure the length, width, height in the fish and they throw the fish back in the water. Uh, it's an application known as electrofishing. Now, this is something that federal scientists can do uh, but that's not something you can do. You can't go buy some electro fishing gear. But if you go on YouTube, you'll, you can check it out. You'll see uh, some really uh, interesting uh, videos of, of electro fishing. Uh, it's, uh, the reason they do this is out in freshwater is um, they have to uh, get rid of the invasive species of fish within the Great Lakes and, and fresh uh, rivers and streams. 
um, out in the Mississippi River as well as the Great Lakes. And they've been uh, actively using these batteries to replace some very heavy lead acid batteries um, for electrofishing applications. Uh, some of the other uh, customers include academic customers, MIT, the Naval Academy, uh, UC System, Cal Poly, um, various universities have implemented uh, renewable energy curriculums within the engineering studies um, at the undergraduate and graduate level. So now there's uh, electives uh, where students take to learn about solar and the implementation of, of battery storage uh, at both the system as well as the circuit and other levels as well um, for implementing these systems um, as when they graduate and they take a career within renewable energies. So uh, we're working with universities um, quite a bit in the past several years, um, as well as the uh, oil and gas industry. Um, even though we have renewables right now, we still have to keep looking for uh, new sources of oil and gas. It's really important uh, to do that. And up in Canada, uh, there is a company we do business with called uh, Nanometrics, where, we, where they're looking for new sources of oil and gas in Man Manitoba and Alberta. Um, and these temperatures uh, where they go look for new sources of oil and gas typically are about minus 20 to about minus 30 degrees Celsius. And the issue with the lead acid battery is they can't keep up at very cold temperatures. Um, there's a significant reduction in usable capacity. And so um, with respect to the oil and gas industry, they wanted something that lasts better even at colder temperatures and lithium iron phosphate does perform better at the colder temperatures. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So I've been using this acronym LFP, lithium iron phosphate, lithium ferrous phosphate, LIFEPO, Life E. So this acronym refers to the same type of chemistry. Um, it's, it's the same thing. It's now considered to be a state-of-the-art battery chemistry. There's a tremendous degree of thermal and chemical stability. It also has a very, what they call tight, uh, ultra-stable iron phosphate bond that's used um, in the electrodes that are used to compose this particular battery. And we're seeing about 2,000 to 3,000 charge cycles. In fact, um, we introduced the batteries back in 2012. And we've been uh, going back to the original customers um, the past nine years, there's, a, there's one of some of our original customers was one company out in a company called Sound Projections. It's based in Torrance. Um, and they've built these amplifier systems. They use them in schools and churches and things like that, where they had used lead acid batteries and they were putting these lithium iron phosphate batteries. And we've been able to uh, go back to them. Um, this is year nine um, and the original ones they still have out there. So uh, this is very different um, than even other lithium uh, batteries that you use in your phone. So for example, in your phone, like the iPhone, you have the battery that's in here. This is called a lithium ion polymer stack. A lithium ion polymer battery is different than a lithium iron phosphate battery. Um, the charge cycles in your phone typically is about 800 cycles at the, at the most. And so you probably notice with your phones after two or three years, because you cycle the batteries every day on, on your cell phone, it deteriorates after that time period. And, um, and you might be wondering, well, what, you know, it's, it's consumed. So it's very different than a lithium iron phosphate battery with about two to 3000 charge cycles. And the reason why they don't use that in the phones is typically they're trying to uh, reach a particular retail price point. Um, so the, well, uh, you know, there's a bit of investment in this particular chemistry, but um, that's the reason why. And we wanna differentiate this uh, battery chemistry from other lithium uh, rechargeable chemistries. Now, if we compare it to uh, lead acid batteries, um, so you've all used a lead acid battery at some point. Uh, it's, in, it's in your car. Um, so you've probably seen what happens when a lead acid battery goes bad. It can sulfate, it can vent, leak. You're dealing with uh, toxic lead. Um, and so my old car, uh, I had a lead acid battery go bad on me. Uh, the acid came out of the starter battery and ate the metal uh, terminals and then it destroyed the harness and I had to go get all this changed um, the mechanic and it was it was kind of a pain whereas this particular chemistry is inherently safe it's um, you have a strong chemical bond and you're not dealing with toxic materials there's no sulfuric acid and no lead so from an environmental standpoint it's better um, with respect to a lead acid battery it's it's quite heavy you know you've probably lugged those things around took them on a had to uh, grab a dolly to take them around during field day or whatnot. Uh, this is about a, th a third the weight, a quarter to a third the weight of a lead acid battery. It's quite lightweight. In fact, I'm holding a, a 20 amp hour battery right here. This is about five and a half pounds 
Um, whereas if you were to use this to operate your radio equipment, for example, you would need a battery that's probably four times heavier in order to operate uh, the equipment. Uh, lead acid batteries, only about two to 300 cycles are actually usable. Whereas we're seeing about two to 3000 cycles for this chemistry. A lead acid battery, if you've ever left it turned on uh, with your equipment, what you'll, there's no notion of protection built into the battery. So for example, let's say you were to leave your equipment turned on with a lead acid battery and you bring the voltage down to a point, for example, eight volts or something like that, you would not be able to recover or recharge that battery because there is no circuitry in there that protects it uh, so it doesn't turn off. So you can easily over discharge the battery, overcharge them. Whereas with this particular chemistry, there is a circuit board built into it. It's known as a protection circuit module battery management system. And what this is doing is it's preventing over current, over discharge, under voltage, over voltage, thermal protections. And also it's doing the balancing of all the cells within, within the battery. So within the pack, you have these cylindrical cells that are used to compose the pack. And all of these cells are used to build up the battery, little cylinders that go in there. And this equalization is happening with the circuitry inside of the battery. Um, with, uh, res with respect to lead acid batteries in terms of usable capacity, um, there's an effect called the Pukert's effect for lead acid batteries, where if you were to use what's known as a 1C discharge, for example, if you have a 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery and I pulled 12 amps out of that battery, maybe about 50% is actually usable. Whereas this particular chemistry, nearly 100% 100 is usable. So that's a huge difference because you can use a fairly small battery. This is a 20 amp hour battery, for example, to run 100 watt radios, full power for about eight to 10 hours on HF sideband. So um, of a lot of power uh, within a small package um, uh, for, for running your radio equipment. So very different um, than a lead acid battery. Uh, with respect to memory effect, uh, we're not seeing any memory effect in this chemistry. So you can charge at any different state of charge. So for example, 25%, 50%, 75%. So you can use the battery for both cyclic and standby applications. Um, so a cyclic application is an application where you charge up the battery, you completely discharge the battery, and you charge it up again. That's a cycle. Um, whereas a standby application is like an uh, uninterruptible power supply, a UPS system like your APC or, or trip light system that you have. So because we're not, we're not dealing with this memory effect, we can use it for, for both applications. And that gets us into our next point, um, the effects of partial cycling. So we can charge the battery. Uh, if we partial cycle a battery, uh, we're not experiencing that degradation. And a partial cycle doesn't count as a full cycle. So what, what does that mean? So that means is if I was to partially cycle this battery, then I could extend the service life in years out for this particular chemistry. And that's exactly what we're seeing with the customers um, and the data is showing that's come back over the nine years um, that that's the case. They were able to extend that service life out. So we can confidently say, you know, at least nine years right now. Um, that they've been out there um, and performing. Self-discharge about a few percent per year, um, which is considered to be quite low. So that's a big advantage there um, compared to lead acid battery. So this highlights that point. Um, you, on my left, I have a 12 volt, 12 amp hour lead acid battery, maybe about six amp hours are actually usable, um, at which point the voltage gets too low, whereas this chemistry uh, nearly 100% is usable. Uh, a lot of questions about the circuit module that's inside the batteries. What does this circuit module do and wh why is it needed? Um, so it's balancing and equalizing all the cells in the battery, does the over voltage protection. So that means if you hit the battery with a high voltage, the circuitry uh, protects itself and doesn't let the current come in with a high voltage uh, and over current. So let's say you pull too much current out of the battery. Um, the battery uh, will then prevent the, uh, protect the, the output, protect the cells in there if you're pulling too much current. Then this over discharge protection, that's the low voltage protection. So around 10 volts or so, um, the battery shuts off that output. So the cells are protected. They're sitting at voltage um, as well. And you have the short circuit protection and temperature protections as well. So that's the protection circuit module that's built into every single battery that we offer. And all of the uh, batteries that we have um, on our website, you'll see the BLF series batteries. That's the one that's used typically for the deep cycle use for, for ham radio equipment. All of the batteries have the circuitry built into it. Um, we also provide a battery spec sheet. So some of uh, some customers, they're interested in 
building charging systems uh, for the batteries. Um, and we can provide you with all of the parameters that are needed um, in order uh, to set that up for charging the batteries. Uh, the internal impedance is very low on this chemistry. It's about five to 10 milliohms, which is quite low compared to a lead acid battery. So you don't get that voltage drop as the battery ages. So you'll probably have seen with a, an SLA battery um, that you've used, you'll notice how it degrades. You charge up the battery as the lead acid battery gets older. You don't achieve that higher voltage over 13 volts. And that's because you're dropping across this internal resistance um, that's within the battery. With this particular chemistry, mm -hmm. you don't see that. Um, you're still sitting about 13.2 to 13 and a half volts. Um, and you can plug it directly into the equipment. You don't need a battery booster or anything like that for this particular chemistry. And this curve here highlights this point. So what you'll see here, this is for the 20 amp hour battery. If you were to pull, for example, as a four amp discharge, you'll notice that 95% of this discharge curve, 95% of this capacity is usable for the battery, at which point around 10 volts, the battery shuts off. This is what we call uh, the depth of discharge curve. This axis is our voltage on, on the Y axis here. And then on the X axis, this is the capacity. So 20 amp hour battery, 95% is usable. And then the battery's protection circuit module shuts off that output at around 10 volts. So we have that built into the circuitry. So even if you were to leave your equipment turned on, it's still protected. You, you can still recharge the battery. It's no problem uh, in that regards. Um, this is also a very interesting curve. This is the available capacity versus temperature. So I talked about earlier um, up in Canada, you know, why are they switching to lithium iron phosphate batteries um, from, from lead acid batteries or AGM batteries? AGM is a type of lead acid battery called absorbed glass mat. Uh, it's a sealed lead acid battery. And the reason why is if you look at minus 20 degrees Celsius, uh, minus 20 Celsius is about minus four Fahrenheit. Um, if you see what's going on here, if you were to pull one C discharge, meaning for example, if I have a 12 amp hour battery, pull 12 amps out of it, about 30% is usable on an AG, uh, AGM battery. But for lithium iron phosphate, above 80% is still usable at this very cold temperature. So you have a battery that performs well at the cold temperatures. And then at the higher temperatures, uh, you also have all of that capacity usable. So that's important, for example, out in the desert, for, uh, for example, we can actually go up to about 60 Celsius, 143 Fahrenheit. So um, we get, we don't have that much, uh, what they call, it's called a D rating uh, in the engineering or battery field. Um, they use that term D rating is that how does the battery D rate um, at cold temperatures and very high temperatures? How does it deviate from um, the usable capacity? And so it still sits quite high, uh, even at the cold temperatures. Um, some questions we get with respect to the runtime. So how do I calculate the runtime based on the power? So we have an example here where we look at the con average continuous power of our equipment. So our power is equal to the voltage times the current. So an example here, I do a 10 watt example. If I had 12 volts times 12 amp hours, uh, 10 watts continuous, the voltage times the amp hours, amp hours are the energy uh, uh, capacity of the battery. And I take the voltage times the amp hours to get the watt hours. So like kilowatt hours in your electric bill, a thousand watt hours is one kilowatt hour. So this is 144 watt hours, about 0.144 uh, kilowatt hours. And I take 144 watt hours divided by 10 watts. I get about 14 hours of runtime at 10 watts continuous. Now, Radio is very different. Radio, there's something known as, we have to consider what's called a weighted average. Um, your the equipment's transmitting at a high power and then receives at a low power. Transmit high, receive low. And so um, we do an example with QRP. So let's say you're operating uh, on an FT817, 818, K Elecraft KX2, KX3, the new ICOM 705. Um, these are all QRP radios, handhelds, et cetera. Um, if I was using a 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery, about 40 hours would be usable in terms of, we're looking at if you're doing eight hours a day, several days on a single charge at QRP. Now, if you're gonna operate a hundred Watts, um, you have to use a larger battery. So the 20 amp hour is quite popular. That gets you about 10 to 11 hours, um, assuming you're transmitting 20% of the time and receiving 80% of the time. So we have a couple examples here based on a QRP as well as a full 100 watt transmission. But again, we're using a fairly small battery uh, in terms of size 
uh, versus what we have to use before with a lead acid battery. We're going to shift gears. We're going to talk about some uh, cool examples with go boxes. Um, uh, and so this is an example from W6GYC. Uh, it's got a 20 amp hour battery um, inside of a, a, a briefcase go box that he's built. Um, these are some examples um, where they're using a controller, a uh, solar controller, in order to keep the battery fully charged while operating the radio. So you can operate the radio while charging the battery using a solar controller, which is this box right here, and the 20 amp hours inside the case. Uh, and he's operating uh, at the full power, 100 watt output. And so you can charge and discharge at the same time, uh, which is very good for an emergency use um, can, situation. Um, you want something where you can quickly deploy solar panels and charge up the batteries. And we'll show you more of those later in the presentation. Um, this is Greg Lane uh, at the top left. Uh, he's with his team doing field day. They're operating uh, QRP on a KX3. Uh, they're using a 15 amp hour battery uh, for, for field day applications. Um, this is really cool. This is out in Norway, uh, uh, LA9XGA. This is a uh, tour in Norway. He's doing summits on the air. If you're not familiar with summits on the air, this is a contest out of UK where you go climb these mountaintop sites and you activate these, these sites, you get points and bragging rights. And I'll read you what he wrote. He says, this summits on the air hike started from, from my home Ixis ranch at 0600 UTC. And it took me around three hours to get to the summit. Uh, the weather today was almost unbelievable with minus 10 degrees and a clear blue sky and the view from the summit almost indescribable. On this activation, I was using my Elecraft KX3 with five to 10 watts of output, two bina power, uh, 12 volt, eight amp hour batteries and a buddy stick multi-band vertical antenna. I made a total of 153 QSOs on this remote summit activation. So 153 QSOs, it's a lot of QSOs, and it gives you kind of a perspective in terms of how the battery performs at, at fairly cold temperatures. This is at minus 10 degrees Celsius. And of course, at, you know, if you're going to do soda in, in Norway, you got to have uh, some skis and a tent, a uh, sleeping bag, and at night you got to build a fire. So keep that in mind if you're in Norway. Um, going to transition. We're going to talk about kind of uh, the solar setups. Um, a lot of you are interested in how do, I, uh, how do I do solar? It seems complicated. Uh, well, it's, it's actually very easy. So there's three components that you need. First is the battery, First, second, a solar panel, and third item is a controller. And many uh, question, well, why do I need a controller? Isn't there circuitry in the battery? So I wanna emphasize here and clarify a couple of things that came up. Um, so there's circuitry that's built into the battery and the circuitry in the battery does the balancing protection of uh, overcharging over current. This is different than the solar controller circuitry. The solar controller circuitry, what it does is it takes the voltage from the panel, the higher voltage of the panel, and it reduces that voltage to correctly charge the battery. So you still need a controller with the battery in order to charge from solar. And um, we're gonna do a little bit of show and tell here. I'm gonna stop this here. I'm gonna switch back to the camera. So you can see me, um, and we have some of these foldable solar panels here. This is some of the uh, new products that we have. Um, this is the BSP40 light series. Uh, this is a foldable 40 watt solar panel. It kind of folds up like this. Um, this is a monocrystalline battery. Uh oh, sorry. Uh, hopefully that was not a big bang for everybody. Um, this is a 40 watt solar panel. Um, it folds up pretty nicely. You can put it in a backpack. Um, and use it out in the field. Um, and it's quite, it's getting, uh, gaining uh, quite a bit of popularity because uh, a lot of you that uh, want something that's really portable uh, have something quite portable right now. And you can chain these together. So this is one 40 watt solar panel, but you could expand it out because there's something called a chain connection on the back over here. So if you can see that in the camera there, this is chain. Um, you can expand these, these out and it builds upon our BSP28 solar panel um, that we had uh, for over the past several years. We do have some other uh, foldable solar panels. This is our 60 light series. And so the BSP60 light, same concept. Um, it fills, uh, it, it comes up over here as well. So um, close that. So it folds up like this, it's very, very easy and portable and um, it's very easy uh, to take out in the field. So 
we got several options in terms of solar panels um, that can be used for for um, for uh, for use out in the field as well. Um, so we have these rigid panels that we originally introduced, and we started adding these these foldable light series panels as well. Um, some questions we get is how many watts for the solar panel. So it really depends on the size of the battery. So if I have like a 12 volt, 12 amp hour battery, a 60 watt panel would charge it in about two hours. Um, so you can use a, a fairly small uh, panel setup. It's very portable, very light in order to charge up, charge up the battery. Uh, again, very common question here. Do I really need a solar charge controller? I just want to hook it up directly to the battery. Uh, you still need the controller. Um, the voltage can range anywhere between 15 to 22 volts. So that controller regulates that voltage in order to correctly charge the battery. Um, this is a very common question as well. Um, do I need a special charger for these batteries? We wanted to clarify this. There was some confusion, confusion about this. Um, so uh, the battery, what it wants to see is a current limited uh, constant voltage power supply. You can use a linear or a switch mode supply to charge these batteries. The overcharge and over voltage protection and the balancing function, that's all built into the circuitry in the battery. So you do not need a fancy balancing charger. So some of you might be uh, working with like quadcopters and RC cars where they have a special balancing charger with balancing connectors. Um, and you don't need that. You can apply a voltage anywhere between 13.8 to 15 volts and then current limit the supply to the maximum charging current for the batteries. For example, two, four, five, 10 amps, et cetera, it really depends on the model. Now we, pa we pair the batteries with power supplies um, that are fixed voltage and have fixed current. So if you have something, what we call the, this is the BPC series chargers. It looks something like this. Um, these are, you can purchase uh, as a bundle. So you don't have to lug around a very large, you know, linear power supply out in the field, et cetera. But if some of you are in the shack and wanted to charge from the benchtop power supply, if you don't have the knobs to adjust the voltage and the current uh, to current limit, there is accessory products available now. One of which is a company called, you're familiar with is West Mountain Radio's Epic PowerGate product. Now this product can be used with the batteries in order to uh, use your benchtop supply, for example, or you can even hook up an alternator to this as well. Um, and solar panel, it does solar charging as well. Now inside this unit uh, is a way the current limit the input to the batteries. What you do is you first hook up the battery here, you hook up your radio to the out, the benchtop supply here, if you wanted to use that. And inside of the controller, you will set up uh, for the lithium and then set the, the charging current. Now this product um, has been used uh, for also remote control. So some of you want to be able to remote control repeaters with our batteries. Um, it has a USB output as well um, to actively check to see how many amps are coming uh, uh, into the battery from, let's say, a solar setup uh, or from uh, the power supply uh, at the repeater site. So this is, no, this is an option. It's a third-party product, but it's fully compatible um, with the batteries and other companies that have products as well. Uh, we also have a car charger product called BPC-1503 car um, that lets you charge the battery from a vehicle cigarette lighter. Uh, it's, it's a fixed amperage uh, supply uh, as well. So those are now available on our website. Uh, again, what about third-party chargers? Are they compatible? So West Mountain Radio Epic Power Gates fully compatible, Buddy Pulse Mini. Again, no cost products, battery tender, power poles, charge system for the marine applications, Optimate. Uh, please consult the user manual to see whether or not lithium iron phosphate is directly mentioned. Okay, so you'll see lithium, lithium ion, ION, make sure lithium iron phosphate is mentioned in the user manual. So that's uh, hopefully that clears up that, uh, throws some confusion there on that. Um, you know, what's the battery's charging? Uh, what's the open circuit voltage? You can charge anywhere between 13.8 to 15 volts, and then it rests about 13.2 to 13 and a half volts. Um, and so uh, it works well with all uh, radio equipment that wants to see 13.8 plus or minus 15% in terms of the voltage. So you do not need a battery booster. Some of you have probably been using battery boosters on lead acid batteries um, to raise that voltage because it's too low to, to get the best performance out of the radio. In this case, it's not needed. Simply just connect the, this battery directly to the radio equipment and you're good to go. 
uh, most common question, number one, um, what size of battery do I need? How long will it last on my radio? So you need to know the total power consumption. You need to know uh, what's your desired runtime. Uh, what's your power level going to be? 10 watts, 50 watts, 100 watts. So we have this chart that we've made. It's also on our website to help you select batteries um, for uh, particular radios based on transmit powers. So if I was using um, a QRP radio, uh, uh, any of the QRP radios that are, let's say, 10 watts, um, a six amp hour battery, about 12 hours of runtime, 20% uh, transmit, 80% receive, um, 12 amp hour battery, about 24 hours. So, uh, you know, if you do eight hours a day, that's several days on a single charge, even on a 12 amp hour for QRP. If we go to 50 watts, 50 watts, typically, you know, VHF, UHF, um, maybe simplex, 50 watts, FM. Um, you know, 12 amp hour battery is about 10 hours, a 20 amp hour, about 17 hours. So um, you have to increase the size of the battery a bit to, to do 50 watts. Um, and then if you go to 100 watt transmission, uh, you know, I'm using a 50, 20 amp hour battery. This is right here, holding in one hand. You can get about eight to 10 hours um, on HF sideband transmission, 20% uh, transmit, 80% receive. Um, I wanted to also highlight the new FT8 mode. It is a bit of a larger uh, duty cycle. So FT8 is different than um, HF sideband and PSK31, um, and maybe the other digital modes that you've been using. So um, we suggest the larger battery, um, you know, 15, 20 amp hour would be good because you can factor in that duty cycle there. So I just wanted to hit on that as well. Um, gonna transition, we're gonna talk about some of the, um, work that we've been doing right now uh, with some of the commercial customers, uh, uh, gas company, um, they've had some sites where they monitor kind of sensors that they've been working on uh, for, for gas uh, emissions, et cetera. Um, so they've, they had legacy lead acid batteries that they had, they wanted to replace out because they had to send technicians to these sites um, for monitoring and, and um, they don't want to keep changing lead acid batteries. So uh, we've been doing a pilot with them on our 20 amp hour battery um, with this piece of electronics that they've been using in order to charge it up. And they have a bunch of DCUs here um, uh, for charging off solar, uh, this particular sensing system um, that can be used for, for gas monitoring. Uh, up in Canada, uh, Nanometrics, this is, uh, this is a really cool uh, project um, that we've been doing business with them for a few years now. Uh, they have uh, a KU band satellite based telemetry system for oil and gas exploration. That's a mouthful there. Uh, so they don't have access to LTE cellular. Um, the radio packet is the bandwidth is not high enough. Um, and so they went to satellite. So uh, this is about minus 30 degrees Celsius performance. They've used 20 amp hour batteries, uh, solar controller um, system, as well as panels. For charging it up, and you might be wondering, well, why is why are there four panels here? Um, well, you, we're it's fairly f up far in the north. The solar day is very short. Um, they need some. They need to be able to charge this equipment pretty fairly quickly. Um, this is out in Louisiana and Texas. Uh, same concept. It's solar-based telemetry, oil and gas monitoring system. They do use LTE cellular. Um, they do use a radio packet. Uh, connection as well. Um, they use 20 amp hour and 30 amp hour batteries and they've replaced the entire SLA AGM battery uh, with lithium iron phosphate based on the performance that they've been seeing just lasts much longer um, in comparison. Been a lot of different events. Um, so uh, I hope to see you guys uh, as things open up. Uh, uh, we hope for, uh, we, we believe Pacificon will be happening in the fall from what we're hearing um, up in San Ramon in the Bay Area. Um, that will be uh, hopefully going on uh, as this fall. We'll, we'll stay tuned. Um, going to talk about kind of the, we had requests to talk about go boxes um, a bit in more depth as well and commercial go boxes. Uh, at the top here, this is one of our dealers, Impulse Electronics. They've built this go box. Um, uh, they've got the power pole connectors as well as uh, voltage output and, and USB. And then some customers, they've built their own out of Pelican cases um, so this is cool because you can put the battery as well as the radio and controllers and things like that all inside of a Pelican uh, box or Pelican style box um, and have ready for you in case of an emergency situation. So having, you know, all this equipment is great, but making sure that you're ready to go is very important because then you can get a good sense 
and very good understanding of how everything performs uh, on, under battery operation. So uh, it's a good project if you guys wanted to do that. There's some commercial uh, PowerWorks has a, a Go box called Mega Box and Power Box products where they same concept. Um, it's like an ammo can where uh, it's been modified and they put all the uh, you know uh, digital display, USB. Um, you've got all of the uh, car socket and then you have these posts as well. Some customers have made some modifications. They've actually put, for example, the Epic unit in there and they take this with them. Um, it's in the car, it's ready to go wherever it is uh, in case of an emergency. Uh, please take a look at some of the articles. They've been written in CQ magazine um, as well as QSD magazine as well. Um, and then Stu Thomas has written a nice book, KB1HQS on portable operation considering uh, batteries and portable power. Um, uh, John Handler is on the, here on the Zoom call as well. Check out his article in Ultimate Motorcycling Magazine. has a great article called Ham on a Hog 3, talking about use of the batteries with the ICOM 705. So certainly check that out. Um, there's other markets we're in, audiovisual, uh, as well as uh, marine. We're getting more into the marine market uh, for trolling motors and uh, fish finders. Uh, as well as radio communications equipment. Robotics is a growing industry right now. It's a lot of, ro yeah, if you've been following the robotics industry, it's uh, you get all these different types of health robots and pharmaceutical robots and warehouse robots. This is starting to take off quite a bit. So keep your eye out on the robotics industry. It's a growing market, um, as well as uh, RVs and campers. So larger 100 amp hour, 200, 200 amp hour batteries. We do have larger batteries as well on our website, as well as for the UPS systems. Um, and I was gonna talk about some of our new products for 2021. Um, we uh, wanted to share this with you. So we showed some of our foldable solar panels, you can see there as well as some expanded, and we've done some changes to our power pack lines to improve uh, inverter performance, as well as a capacity of the batteries as well. So we made some changes there. Um, and so we have those available, the BSP 40 lights about uh, quite lightweight, um, four pounds. And then we have the 60, BSP 60 light, which is about five and a half pounds. Um, BSP 100 light, 100, uh, 10 pounds. So 100 watt output, as well as the BSP 100, um, which is about eight pounds as well. It's a very thin flex panel. This one, uh, it's, it's quite thin. If, uh, you can mount this on an RV or camper, um, and it's, it's a really neat uh, product as well. And then we've got the controllers. Um, we've made adjustments to the controllers as well, improving performance in terms of digital displays, giving you information on charge current coming from the panels, uh, uh, much more, much easier to use. Now, uh, there is a, a prize. Um, so uh, uh, Brett, I, I spoke to Brett uh, earlier. Um, so uh, the BLF-1215A plus charger will be given to the winner uh, accordingly for that particular field day uh, in April. So good luck with that. Um, and that's it. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. Sorry for the hiccup earlier, uh, but it happens. Great. <clears throat> so who has a question? Uh, Steve. Can the batteries <clears throat> or more than one battery be used in parallel or in series to up the voltage? That's a great question. So parallel, uh, you can do parallel and expand uh, as needed. It has to be the same model of battery, okay? So can't mix, for example, a 12 amp hour with a 15 amp hour, et cetera. It's gotta be the same model to expand out. Series is up to 24 volts right now. Uh, we can't do higher voltage because it could trip the BMS. Um, so if you need 36 or 48, et cetera, you still have to get our 36 or 48 volt packs. But with the parallel, we haven't seen any issues when you, when you start adding them together, increased capacity, as long as it's the same uh, model um, and it works. Anyone well, there, else? There are a number of questions that are backed up on the chat. Yeah, should we go through those? Yeah, we can go through them. Um, okay, um, let me, how do you compare to the zero batteries? Do you consider them competition? Uh, goal zero, is that correct? I don't know, zero. it just says zero. Yeah, I don't know if it's, if, so if it's goal zero, it's different. Goal zero's product um, is based on a, it's an NCM pack that um, it, it has uh, some limits in terms of current discharge uh, for the outputs. Uh, 
uh, to, to run radio equipment specifically. Um, so the BLF series has been uh, set up to match that voltage directly for radio equipment, about 13.2 to 13 and a half volts. So theirs might be uh, a little bit too high or too low uh, from my understanding. And then the amperage, I think the DC current amperage might be also current limited as well to, to run a hundred watt radio, for example. So what we've done here is we made some adjustments um, on the circuit board in the BLF series batteries, where we've put um, kind of higher amperage capability boards in here in order to push the discharge current uh, with, with the packs. So that's, I think that's the difference. Do, um, do you offer MPPT controllers or just the PWM? Yeah, it's a good question. We do have MPPT controllers as well. They're, they start at $90. Uh, they go up from there. Um, I wanted to clarify the PWM circuitry that's used. It does not put out any noise or RF hash. Um, there's also, we have a CCCV charging profile as well. So we've, we made sure that it's fully compatible with the lithium iron phosphate batteries and also made sure there's no, there's no hash on, on the HF bands. Um, one of the questions uh, from Bill was, what is the best procedure and temperature range for storing bio batteries uh, for weeks or months? So the temperature for operation, um, if you're, uh, you can operate between minus 20 to 60 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, if you're going to not use the battery, I would suggest every two to three months, let the batteries take a charge. There is a circuit board inside of the battery that pulls a very small amount of current to equalize the cells. So uh, we have to implement that circuitry in order to make sure there's equalization across the cell banks. Um, uh, and that, that, that guarantees that. So just hit it with the charge every two to three months. Um, if you don't let the, if you let the battery sit for like a year or something and you don't touch it, you could lose 3% of its capacity uh, permanently. So we, de we definitely advise every few months you do hit it with a charge. So you don't, you don't lose that capacity. You know, we want you to make sure you have all that capacity always usable to you. Is there, okay. is there any penalty for um, storage above or below certain temperatures? Uh, we don't advise above 60 Celsius. Uh, we don't advise storage <laughs> below minus 20 Celsius because the electrolyte will, it's at that point, my, less than minus 20 Celsius, um, it, it does freeze um, the electrolyte. So just stay above minus 20 Celsius. Uh, above 60 Celsius, if you store it, the battery circuitry, the thermal, uh, uh, it's, it's disengaged. So it can't balance or equalize above 60 Celsius, above 143 Fahrenheit. So uh, we had to, we put that thermal protection, uh, that thermal couple in there uh, so that the battery is not active uh, above. But if you're 143 Fahrenheit, um, we have, these are considerations in Arizona because so, the Arizona has got this, you got this really high end extreme. So um, they have, they use some kind of forced air cooling and cabinets and things like that. And so we've dealt with the desert stuff as well. Thanks. Desert conditions. Greg asked uh, Kevin whether he can keep a battery on a trickle charger um, for 24 hours a day. Yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, because the battery has the over voltage protection built into it, um, your the chargers that we're providing, as we mentioned before, these are power supplies. So it's providing the charge, the voltage and the current. The battery is taking whatever it needs to charge, and then it will... Uh, it will, the charge current will stop. So you, you can do that. Um, you can leave it attached uh, to the unit. Some, a lot of customers, what they do is they just plug the little power supply into the, into the for example, the barrel connection here. And then they have our, the BPC supply that you see here. And then they hook this up to the radio equipment. And then periodically, they'll just plug it in when they want to charge it. And if they leave it attached, plugged into the AC outlet, you, you can do that. Uh, it just takes longer to charge the battery when you charge and discharge the battery at the same time, because you're pulling power out of the battery and you're putting power back in. So you can do that as well. Um, if you want something where, uh, and this might hit on that same point, I'm gonna expand on that a bit. So um, some customers had asked, well, I want to hook up, for example, the, the power supply and solar at the same time. Okay, I wanna do both. Uh, I wanna leave it attached. So. The EPIC is what we suggest for that because the, there's a logic in here that will start with the solar first if it's present, otherwise it will go to the power supply. So that's how we suggest if you want to charge, I want to leave, you want to leave the solar attached, you want to leave the power supply attached. That's what we suggest. Um, 
And so, uh, but if you're just leaving, using the little, uh, the BPC product, you can just plug it into the barrel here and then, you know, plug the radio there. You can also charge and discharge through the power pole connector. Uh, this is wired in parallel on the circuit board. So keep that in mind as well. So if there's systems where you want to, you know, use other charging systems, things like that, yes, you can do that. Now, does your circuit, uh, internal circuit, keep track of the cycles? Uh, it, there is no counter. So we have not, we have not implemented a counter. No. Okay. And, uh, some of these you've already answered. So I'm trying to, once somebody has asked, what about pure sine wave inverters? Yeah. So pure sine wave is, uh, is, uh, the way to go uh, on a lot of equipment um, that tends to be uh, pure sine wave tends to be very important on um, especially for medical like CPAP and BiPAP machines um, and uh, you want to use pure sine wave because also it's very efficient pure sine wave tends to be about 90 some percent efficient versus modified so the efficiency is much higher when you're running off battery you want you want something to be maximally efficient so you don't the piece of equipment doesn't consume uh, too much power itself. So I definitely recommend uh, pure sine wave inverters um, uh, it, it for use. Our power pack products have the pure sine wave inverters already built into it on our M500 and higher product. Um, so that's already built into the product. Uh, and then there's other third party pure sine wave inverters um, we can recommend if you want, uh, if you need to use that for like computers and, and laptops and, and routers. So <laughs> that was a joke, but my router went out earlier. <laughs> Does, um, does anybody else have a question? Yeah, Gary uh, has his hand up. Okay, and then we'll go to Jonathan. Unmute. Now you can hear me. Okay, um, you know what? Uh, thanks, Brad. Kevin, I have a question. What, what is the average cost for amp hour for a lithium iron versus a lead acid? So lithium iron phosphate batteries, um, so a three amp hour battery at retail is about $49. A 20 amp hour is about $193. Um, lead acid batteries, uh, yeah, they are cheaper uh, in comparison, um, but you'd be changing out the lead acid battery every 300 cycles or so. So a year, year and a half, we have to change them out and just keep repeating to do that. Whereas we're seeing, you know, uh, the nine years have transpired and we have original batteries still out there. So mm -hmm. you could argue that the total cost of ownership is less for this chemistry than for lead acid batteries. You do, you spend money up front, but it lasts right. so long um, that you would save money in the long run. And, and this price has been very, um, the, the price has been very uh, stable. So uh, unlike lead acid, lead acid batteries are going up in price every year uh, because the, because they're not, you know, mining lead, sources of lead are, you know, they're not looking for it anymore using recycled lead. So you could argue it is cheaper in the, in the long haul if you were to spread it out over that nine year period. Yeah, because I, I was wondering if if you see the in the in the long haul, as you mentioned it, um, at least in the United States, uh, I don't know where your lithium source comes from, but in the United States, there's more discoveries of lithium and stuff. And as time goes yeah. on, I would yeah. I would think that the price of the battery would would drop per for amp hours. Yeah, Use there's, that. yeah, so. that's the um, that's the that definitely um, the lithium iron phosphate mix. Uh, one of the things, uh, the the cost of lithium is a component. The cost of the um, electrolyte as well. Mm -hmm. the, there's an electrolyte that's used within the lithium iron phosphate um, that's expensive. So uh, it's different than other lithium chemistries as well. And then we also are packaging in this kind of like very you know, this is a cylindrical cell. It's different than like a pouch cell um, where the materials costs are, are less, but we found that this type of cell is extremely rugged uh, in the in the long run uh, for use, so. Yeah, yeah, because what, what I'm really, play, I'll, I'll end by saying this, is that it, it sounds like I shouldn't play the game that uh, I'll buy these things in a couple of years and they'll be half price. They, they're always, the given lithium becoming more common and I, I yeah. realize there's a lot more electronics and all that. You get more pound, you know, bang for your buck. But you see the price being pretty stable for the next X number of years. I see. Yeah, I see. Because if you have your supply and demand in terms of raw materials, can be, you know, if you're if the supply can keep meeting and that demand is there, then we can yeah. keep stabilizing on the price points. And we're, we're, you well, know, the, the, there was some concern with lithium deposits dis disappearing, but 
it's actually, there's a lot more sources being found. Um, so we've domestic sources, uh, South, South America has a lot of resources too um, for lithium. Chile, for example, is huge in terms of the... Uh, are, are you going to tap into the lithium source that's in Nevada by any chance? We had, uh, we had that's a good question. Um, I know that there was in the battery conference that was coming up, uh, they're going to be discussing those sources coming up this fall in, in Detroit, the batteries. There's a show in Detroit in every September. It didn't happen last year, of course, but... Um, it's a good it's a good industry conference if you guys are interested in batteries um and those companies are going to be there talking about th th those nevada sources they they will be there from my understanding so i'll get thanks uh, appreciate Jonathan? it yeah hi first off uh kevin you know i've been running your batteries since 2016 five years and it's probably the piece of kit that when i go portable i have to worry the least about uh, i have two quick questions the first is are you building your own cells we have our own self production so this is our own cell production uh, we've been doing that since 2012 so we brought the batteries to market in 2012 it was two years of r d work but that gave us kind of what's nice thing about it is we, we we developed a ramp which is good and then we then do all the packaging and development and, and assembly so Excellent. Uh, if I go on Amazon.com and uh, type L-I-F-E-P-O-4, there's a lot of new entrants in the business. And, you know, I'm a believer in you get what you pay for. But, I, you know, I've seen some batteries, if you compare prices that are, you know, some lithium claimed lithium iron phosphate are a third of your prices. Yeah. Now, you know, I love you, bro. But uh, tell me, you know, is it Chinese junk? Pardon the Chinese. Yeah, there's qu the question in terms of price points and, and, and kind of stability in terms of the price points. Um, so as time goes on, um, you know, the entries that come in, uh, it, it's, it really depends in terms of, um, you know, first of all, is lithium iron phosphate is it being claimed and is it lithium iron phosphate? You can tell also based on the, the, the operating voltage of the battery. So that's important to check out. Uh, and making sure that the materials that are being used is, is not a recycled material in the composition of the packs. So that's a concern as well. Um, so yeah, that could be, it's from that standpoint. Um, I, you know, I, I've seen some customers that had a bad experience on. Okay, well, yeah, you know, I buy us. a battery. I want yeah. it to work. I'm yeah, not you want it to work. To you know, you don't want to. Yeah. And we've had a few that did come back to us. Um, you try some other stuff and they weren't satisfied. Plus, I love the fact that you've got that DC coaxial connector and the power pole. It's just perfect. And thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. A couple other questions. Victor, you had a comment or a question about the possible short circuit of the barrel connectors. So the barrel connection that the oh the pin inside so if if you if you uh you're talking about this pin in here so yes yes uh, yeah so you want to make sure that uh there's some customers leave the uh charger attached to the unit um and they package it away uh so if you uh, there's a good degree of separation between this the pin inside and the outer edge um so what i found was uh most customers tend to just leave it attached in there if you apply like a force or anything to it yeah you could but um i haven't seen many i've seen maybe like two instances that it happened but the customers um probably with some damage in transit that they got it, it came in the mail or something like that but yeah it's it, actually it uh the out. uh like our i mean favorite pr 239 259 easy to get inside and then create shock circuit so yeah. uh yeah so what i do is like uh, i have to uh use another thing like this uh, i actually created my own mechanism just like a uh, a, uh, a barrel insert and uh, a uh, uh what's this uh the power pole power pole yeah, yeah power connector so that uh, i can use it as a uh, another connection beside the main connection but keep the safer that's what i do but uh hopefully i mean you guys can <laughs> yeah Give us I'll talk to the team. Yeah. yeah, I'll talk to them to see if they may want to do two power poles. I'll I'll, I'll yeah. propose that for sure. And, uh, I'll talk to them. Victor is available since he copyrighted that to uh, do business with you, just in case you wanted to know. Offer some okay. uh, discounts for us for the club if you can. 
Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, there is a discount code CVARC, C-V-A-R-C. It's still active. Um, if you enter CVARC in the checkout screen, um, it's, it gives you the, the discount um, uh, that uh, you can apply that in there. So I, I believe it's either 10 or 15%. It's somewhere in that range, if I recall. I have to look at my notes, um, but it's in that range. Sounds great. Yep. Warren. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I've got to find the right button. Um, in some of my previous reading, uh, there was a gentleman on Hawaii, and they have very changeable uh, weather conditions. And one of the advantages he found about the lithium ion is that they charge faster than lead acid. But of course, they're more expensive. So his solution was to use some lithium ion in parallel to uh, lead acid type batteries. This way, when he had the good sunlight, the lithium ion would charge, and then the clouds would come in and it would sort of equalize its charge into the lead acid. What's your comment on that? I know that you, you want all same size cells, that's ideal, but what happens? What are the downsides of trying to parallel lithium ion and lead acid, please? So lithium iron phosphate, um, the operating voltage uh, is about 13.2 to 13 and a half volts. And then the lead acid battery sits at a little bit of a lower voltage. Um, if you have one in parallel with the other, the, what will happen is the current's going to flow out of the other, out of the lithium battery to the lead acid battery. It's going to raise that voltage up. Eventually you will get to an equilibrium, assuming there's, you know, ideal scenarios going on where, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to, if the current comes out too quickly out of the lithium battery, it could turn off the lithium battery with the BMS. That's one scenario that could happen. So you have to current limit that input. But the issue is if you current limit the input from the lithium back into the lead acid battery, and then you were to discharge the battery, um, you have one battery that has circuitry built into it. So it's current limited now. And then you have another battery, the lead acid's not current limited. So if you were to run the load, especially at high load outputs, you might suck a lot of, you might reduce the state of charge on the lead acid battery. And so because the current, the lithium battery is up current limit, it's gonna, if you pull too much current, it will shut itself off. It exceeds the current limits. So you might go back into an imbalance again. Um, if it's working for him, curious to get some information on it or an article or something i could i could certainly do some more that, that's my initial thoughts but yeah. um well, and i understand it. i mean I, but if you have like a 100 amp hour uh lithium lithium iron phosphate and then a couple of uh, lead acid that are say 100 amp hour also our radios are not going to be pulling uh, it won't yeah excess and then the the solar panels unless you have a huge thing aren't going to over tend to overcharge that. So, I mean, I'm just trying to get kind of your opinion because I, I realize the float, float charge, the maximum float charge on a lead acid is kind of the minimum on the lithium iron phosphate. So, and, and if you're using it, like if you're off grid, then you're using it every day. So you're trying to get as much as possible. So I'm just, you know, so that's the big issue I think, as you're saying is that you don't want to try to overcharge the lithium iron phosphate needs a constant current and you don't want to over discharge it. Otherwise it can work. It sounds like. Should, it, should, it might be able to work. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, Thank you, Warren. I, uh, Joe, I, and then we'll go to Ben. Yeah, I, um, a little spinoff on what Warren said. You, uh, he mentioned that the uh, uh, lithium ion uh, charge, charge rate is faster. How does, how does recharging compare to a same similar capacity lead acid as far as the time it takes? So the lithium iron phosphate batteries, you can typically charge up to half its capacity, 0.5 C charge rate. Um, the lead acid batteries, you know, about maybe a 10th uh, C, so 0.1 times its capacity. So for example, um, if you have a, a 20 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, max 10 amps for charging. Uh, whereas a lead acid battery, it's only two amps. Um, uh, so otherwise it, it's not, it, the, the lead acid battery's cycle life, the, the performance deteriorates. So yeah, it's about, you know, five times higher um, in terms of the charge rate versus the lead acid. So it's a big difference. It's a big deal for um, 
it's a big deal for uh, a lot of applications, portable use. You want the battery to charge within a few hours. Um, solar, as, as the gentleman had mentioned earlier, uh, you want the battery to take a full charge uh, under full sunlight. Um, so if you were to de you know, deploy something, a portable solar system that has a small battery, you want that battery to charge up within a few hours. Uh, within within that day, so those are all very important in terms of the. That's really important is that faster charge rate in comparison to lead acid batteries um, that you've been using. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Ben, yeah, I, I just had a question: is 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 this kind of technology available in a UPS, or can you re retrofit that in a UPS? Just yes, to... I'd say a lot of the customers that are using it for the APCs and trip lights and other systems are using something, the lithium iron phosphate batteries that are about the 1209 WS. This is the one that's extremely popular for that. Um, so you could use it for the replacement. Um, there's also, if some of you have the fiber optic boxes outside, I don't know if you guys have fiber. Yeah. Um, they have the lead acid battery in that box. If you open it up and if the power fails, which it's been kind of failing the past couple of years, the the grid's been not as stable as it once was but for various reasons. We have a lot of fires these past years. Um, uh, they shut it off and then it runs off that lead acid battery. And, um, and so I've had customers that changed it out uh, with this particular so, product. Drop in, drop in. So yeah, just... they, they put it in there because the charging okay. voltage is within range. And so it sees it as a correct charging voltage. It's in, it's in spec of, of the BMS. And so it takes the charge current and then, um, they, that circuitry, that's the charging circuitry in those boxes, the amper, the charge current is actually fairly low. It's not, it's not high. It's like less than an amp. Um, and so it, it works in that setup. So if you have those fiber optic telecom boxes, I, I don't know what they're called. I think they're called, I want to say D -slam. ONT. Oh, what is it called? Uh, ONTs. ONTs. Yeah, I said yeah. D -slam. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Cause, cause your, I use your batteries on the radio all the time. They're a lot better. I so much better than the uh, lead acid. So, uh, and I have a lot of issues with the uh, UPSs. So thanks a lot. Yep. Anybody else have a question? Uh, we'll just do one or two more and then uh, thank Kevin. Bill, fire away. Um, I have an application um, on a boat and I'm currently using flooded lead acid batteries for both the house battery and the starting battery because the starting battery takes obviously a hell of a lot more current draw than the, uh, than the house battery. But I would be concerned if I was to switch to uh, lithium ion for the house battery because the charging regimens are different. Charging regimen on the lead acid battery, of course, wants to be multi-step and you hit it with a lot of current to start with and then you taper it back off and all that other kind of good stuff. So I would be uh, reluctant to try and mix the chemistries uh, in the same system. Or I would make sure that uh, both of those systems can be charged separately with two separate charge controllers to make sure they're both getting the right regimen and they're happy. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a product that addresses that issue. Um, and I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, let me make sure let's see if this works. Uh, okay, so can, is this showing right now? Yes. Okay. So this is a company, um, it's a company called Victron. Um, they make a product called the Orion series. Um, and what this does is it, uh, if you have the house batteries, uh, and you have an alternator as a source, they also use it for the RVs and campers too, but you still have an alternator in, in the marine environment. Um, if you're not charging from solar, uh, uh, that you wanted to charge, uh, the batteries with, and you can use these, these pro this set of products in order to um, interface between the, if it's another DC source that's charging the battery uh, to, to the lithium batteries um, that are available that we have. Now, um, as you said, you, we, we cannot mix in electrically put in parallel the lithium with the lead acid. Um, we have to create separate banks, okay? So uh, if you were to set up a system, you would have to set up um, eventually as you start taking the lead acid batteries out, um, you would have to have a DC-DC uh, charging system 
that would then interface between the alternators of source to the batteries. And the reason that we need that is we still have to current limit the charging into the lithium battery. So um, this is this handles that uh, aspect of it. Uh, uh, and so that that seems to address that. But again, you, yes, you would have to have um, them separated out uh, in order for that to work. Good. Thank you, Kevin. Um, one last question, if anybody has one. I don't see any hands. I don't see anybody struggling for an answer. So I'll yeah. type my email uh, in the chat. So if there's any other further questions, you can send me an email um, and appreciate the opportunity. Kevin, thank you very much. We uh, Let's give Kevin a hand where I really appreciate his presentation. And we also really appreciate the, uh, the gift of the prize. I'm sure the, uh, the winner of our contest will appreciate it even more. And I'll contact you, Kevin, to make arrangements uh, for that. Uh, but in the meantime, um, thanks so much for a great presentation. There's a lot of information, and um, um, we uh, we wish you the very best. Sure, thank you, and uh, look forward to hopefully uh, speaking with you. And um, if you have any questions, you can send an email. And if you'll be at uh, as things start to open up, uh, we'll get to see each other once again down the line. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. All right, have a good evening. See you. Okay, you're welcome to stay on if you want, or if not, have a great evening, and we appreciate your uh, being here and the presentation.